Um, I want to talk about you and about your pitch uh, for Sophie. the country. Hope, you, hope you're enjoying the beauty parade. Uh, yeah, it is a quite a long beauty parade, I have to say, as well. Quite a few candidates. Do you convince you'll make it to the final two? I very much hope so. Last time I was an outsider and uh, against all expectations I made it to the final two and actually ran, I thought, a, a really good campaign. And I think there's all, all to play for this time. But uh, great to speak to you. Um, I'm keen to talk about your uh, pitch uh, to the country uh, in a moment, but just first to reflect uh, on Boris Johnson, who, of course, uh, stood down uh, this week. Uh, you've said that you stayed out of the Boris bubble. Do you think he's a man of integrity? Well, I think there were questions, um, but I don't want to dwell on that because we've made a decision as a party that we needed to respond to the anger of many, many voters and that's why we're, we've made that change and we're having this contest and, and we're going to move forward. Uh, talk about moving forward. Would Boris Johnson get a job in your cabinet if you do become Prime Minister? Well, I think um, he's not the kind who likes working for other people. And uh, I think, you know, his era as Prime Minister and uh, at the top of British politics has concluded and he has changed our history. And we now need to make uh, the, the huge change that Brexit was a terrific success. And, and that's why I, I agree with people like Tom Dugandar and other candidates who said the, the big question is how we get the economy growing. I'm, of course, the, the person who was an entrepreneur. I ran my own business. And I want to have a pro-enterprise environment. So um, I'm also someone who thinks that we shouldn't just stop the corporation tax rises. I think we should cut them so that they're the lowest in Europe and North America. But I also want to do other things so that uh, young people do what I did, which is I was one of the only people in, in my year group in university who went on to start their own business. I want other people to do what I did because that's the way that we'll create the wealth that will pay for uh, tax cuts for families, but also for big institutions like the NHS that are so important for us. And you talked there about tax cuts. Let's be really specific, shall we? Uh, what taxes would you cut and how much would it cost? Well, let me say, first of all, to frame those comments, no Conservative should promise unfunded tax cuts because an unfunded tax cut is just an increase in borrowing that's paid for by future generations. But I also think no Conservative should raise taxes. So the, cut, the, the cuts I'll make, they're not particularly retail. The Sky viewers may uh, say, well, are these really the most important taxes? But corporation tax is the tax that matters most to businesses and defines whether we are a pro-enterprise uh, economy. And we're scheduled to increase the corporation tax to be higher than Japan, America, France or Germany. Uh, I want to cut it to 15%, the lowest we're able, we're allowed to cut it to, according to international agreements, because I want to send a signal so that I want people to be entrepreneurs, to do what I did. That's so how, that's much how we're that going to get the then? growth. That we'll how much would it cost, uh, cutting well, corporation um, tax to 15%? Uh, 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 yeah. So I've, we'll be publishing all our costings, but I can tell you that we can afford to do it within the fiscal rules that we have uh, over a five-year period. That means that debt has to continue to fall as a proportion of GDP. And one of the reasons for that is because a corporation tax, according to the Treasury's own figures, uh, you get half the money back because of increased business activity. And, and that's why, look, it's not the most sexy of cuts, but it just matters in terms of getting our economy moving. And, and that's what entrepreneurs like me feel very strongly about. It does feel a little bit like um, some of the leadership candidates are having their cake and eating it, though. You know, there's a lot of talk about tax cuts being flung around, uh, but no one is necessarily talking about the flip side uh, of this, which is perhaps cutting spending uh, or increasing borrowing. Would you be prepared to do either of those two things? I think we have to follow the fiscal rule that says that over the, over the fiscal period, debt should be falling as a proportion of GDP. We should be reducing the burden on future generations. And that's why I'm not promising uh, some of the tax cuts that other people have promised. I do think the NHS needs the 12 billion a year uh, that, that we're getting from the health and social care levy, much as I so dislike So you'd keep the rise in national insurance so, um, then? You wouldn't reverse that? I would. I, I, I would have actually, uh, I hope I might have found a way to have found that 12 billion uh, without doing it. But we are where we are. And I think the priority now is to go for growth for the economy. 
But what I would say, because I think you want to ask what's different about me, um, I've I'm the longest serving cabinet minister of all the people who are in this leadership contest. And I think that's given me the experience to know that it's very important for trust in politics that you only promise things that you really can deliver. And that's why what I'm offering has been very, very carefully thought through. Uh, another uh, part of your uh, political background is the fact that you, of course, supported uh, remaining in the European Union. Uh, is that a problem for you with the membership? No, because um, that issue is settled. And what they care about is how we make a success of Brexit. And as someone who set up a technology business, I've always thought our big opportunity is to be the world's next Silicon Valley. Um, and that will create enormous wealth. And we can do that because we have fantastic universities great entrepreneurs, um, brilliant scientists. Um, so we need to use our Brexit freedoms, which uh, doing that is easier following Brexit. Use those Brexit freedoms to really uh, turbocharge economic growth, and that will you know, settle our, our economic destiny for this century if we can pull it off. Is it right that you'd have S. McVeigh as your deputy? Yes, I would. And the reason for that is because I recognise that leaders of political parties need to win elections. And that means having an appeal broader than any one person can have. And I work with Esther in Cabinet. She was a brilliant Cabinet Minister. But she's also won very tough elections against Labour in the North, uh, just as I've won very tough elections against the Lib Dems in the South. And together we will be a formidable campaigning team that will win the next election for the Conservative Party. Uh, how about, uh, just looking at a couple more uh, policy uh, things that are uh, potential flashpoints, I guess. Um, Rwanda, do you support the current policy uh, on uh, sending uh, some uh, asylum seekers to Rwanda? I do, but we've got to make it work, and I'm not convinced it is working at the moment. But we have to be honest that um, migration has become massively more mobile um, over the recent years in a, in a globalised world. And therefore, if we want to be a humane country that offers a safe haven for people who genuinely need asylum, then we need to find legal, safe routes for people to come here, uh, not a mad dash for people to put their lives in the hands of people smugglers and, and try and get across the channel. There's also been quite a lot of talk uh, among some of your uh, rivals, I guess, about the so-called war on woke. There's some culture uh, issues as well, some kind of culture war uh, issues. Uh, foremost, of course, uh, the discussion over trans rights. In your view, are trans men men and are trans women women? Well, I think we have to deal with this issue with a great deal of compassion. But biological sex trumps, and we need to be clear about that. And the, the broader point I would make about, uh, you know, about woke issues is that we can, as a mature democracy, have a sensible, tolerant debate about these things. What is not acceptable is to cancel people who have different views to you, because what has made this country great is our belief in open societies and having... Uh, debates and discussing these issues openly and then you come to the best answers. Uh, OK. Um, just looking at the contest ahead, you, you sort of mentioned I'm going to have to go now, beauty. Sophie. I'm sorry. I've got to... Uh... OK. Uh, one, just to squeeze in, very quick last one. Uh, who do you see as your biggest rival in this race? Well, I think it's very difficult to answer that question because um, uh, there are so many people. If you, someone has just joined the race this morning, I gather, um, and uh, I think it's a very wide open field. But what, I, what we found in the last race is that things get winnowed down very quickly, and, and I'll soon find out the answer to that question, and I'll come and talk about it then, Sophie. OK. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeremy Hunt, thank you very much for being uh, on Sky News today. A uh, little interview with uh, Jeremy Hunt to uh, bring you there. And we can talk, I think, straight away uh, with our deputy political editor, uh, Sam Coates. Um, what did you make of uh, the Jeremy Hunt interview? Well, all morning this morning, Sophie, we've been assessing the Tory leadership candidates really on three criteria. Uh, them as uh, personalities and their experience, uh, on what they're saying about tax and on Brexit. And I thought on all three, Jeremy Hunt uh, was interesting. He's emphasising two points about himself. First of all, that he wasn't, as he puts it, part of the Boris 
bubble. So he pretty openly criticises the uh, outgoing prime minister uh, and doesn't make too many bones about it, but wants to emphasise his experience. He talked about being the cabinet minister in this race, or former cabinet minister with the longest amount of experience. Incredibly, I was just checking his record, Sophie, and he became a cabinet minister in 2010, in David Cameron's government when he joined the culture department. He was still going in 2019. His final job was foreign secretary. So that's going to be a key part of his pitch, a record even longer longer than Liz Truss. Um, on Brexit, he's trying to uh, m uh, to make clear uh, he is committed to Brexit. Interesting uh, that he said he admired Tom Tugendhat's point of view, uh, another Remainer, another individual that will keep that Northern Ireland Protocol bill, which Europe don't like, in place for now. But for how long? It's very hard to tell at this stage of the race. And I suspect Brexit will rear its head at some point as we get into the MP rounds of voting. But then we come to the question of tax. And that was really, I thought, the most interesting uh, part of the pitch from Jeremy Hunt to you uh, just now. We've had a slew of other Tory candidates this morning who've come on and said, I can promise income tax cuts. I can promise to reverse the national insurance rise. Not Jeremy Hunt. He's saying, look, if we're going to do tax cuts, it's going to be business taxes in the form of corporation tax. He wants to bring that down to 15 percent. Uh, and he thinks that they can do that within a fiscally responsible, in other words, without busting the budgets, without borrowing too much uh, while preserving uh, the public finances, even though he doesn't quite say uh, how he's going to pay for it yet. That is a dividing line. Uh, now we have Rishi Sunak, I believe, and Jeremy Hunt on one side of that dividing line saying we can't just throw money at the public. And then all the others that we've been talking to this morning, including Grant Shapps, including T Tom Tugat saying we've got to put money in people's pockets right now. The question is, do Tory MPs like the uh, responsible vision or the generous vision? And a lot of this leadership contest is going to turn on that question. Uh, really interesting. Um, Sam, I've got to ask as well, I, I don't know what you think, but you know, with previous leadership races, I've had a rough idea who's going to be in the final two or at least the final three. With this one, look, it's clear that Rishi Sunak's got more uh, MP backers than the other candidates. But after that, things are really pretty split, aren't they? I'm finding it very difficult to call. Oh, God, I, I've no idea how to call it. I couldn't even tell you roughly what order MPs are going to go out at. You mentioned Rishi Sunak. Yes, he's got more uh, Tory MP backers than anybody else. He's also got a bigger anti-Rishi campaign. He's, he's got the biggest number of enemies that I can see of any of the uh, various members. The people who work with Boris Johnson seem to be gunning for him. Uh, I thought Jacob Rees-Mogg, when you sp spoke to him, was uh, maybe not by name, but uh, it was pretty clear he wanted a different approach in the Treasury, better political management. He was laying it thick, uh, taking out his 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 guns and pointing them at Rishi Sunak. So Rishi Sunak has more MPs for him, but more MPs against him. Um, is the question of whether you served with Boris Johnson going to work in your favour or against you? Uh, is the position of Brexit going to become uh, existential? Uh, do people uh, in the Tory MP ranks decide that they want tax cuts now, or that just isn't a responsible uh, approach? Uh, when we pick, when we left this off uh, on Thursday, when Boris Johnson had said he had resigned and MPs were going back to their constituency. Uh, for those that I talked to, they didn't know the answer to the, any of those questions, which is why in the next eight days or so, literally anything could happen. I'm going nowhere near a bookmaker's.